Today, I'll be joined by Edwin Raymond, a 15-year veteran of the New York Police Department who became the highest-ranking whistleblower in NYPD history and remains one of the nation's leading voices on criminal justice reform. We'll be discussing his new book, Inconvenient Cop. So we got my guy right here on the cover. Welcome to the show. Thank you. Thank you for having me, bro. I, I love the title. Um, what's an inconvenient cop? Um, basically, a cop who's not blinded by patriotism and, and tribalism. You know, a cop that's able to see the detriments despite being in the system and uh, that's very inconvenient to the status quo and the, and, and the leadership that is very stubborn in, in, in keeping things the way they are, minus um, being visionaries and, and shifting policing to what we need. So you cover a lot in this book. Um, there's so much to talk about through, and it's through the lens of it's your personal story, but through the lens of you being um, a former police officer. Can you just, for our viewers and, and, and readers who are going to be picking this book up, can you just give them some of the basics on the premise? Well, you know, there are many books written by cops, former cops, um, some written about the detriments, but they kind of jump right into what the issues are and what should be done. I, I thought because of what I'm doing is so different, I thought it was crucial that the reader understands how I got to this point. So this is why it's a memoir instead of just like an instructional book. Um, it, it goes back and it, it alternates between contemporary and flashback, uh, you know, walking the reader through what's happening when I start the police academy. And then the next chapter, I'm three years old and my mother, my mother's dying. You know, chapter three, I'm back in the police academy. Chapter four, my father's dealing with the reality of having to bury his wife and, you know, you know, the poverty and everything else. And it alternates like that uh, for the first part of the book, mm -hmm. because, I, again, I thought it's essential that the reader understands how I became the man that I am today. Highest uh, ranking whistleblower in NYPD history. Break, break down the levels of whistleblowing. Yeah. Because so, there's, there's levels, right? Yeah. Well, yeah. So the thing is, I blew the whistle before even reaching the high rank, you know, and there have been high ranking folks, even higher ranking folks who have contributed to to fights. But um, uh, the way that I'm doing it, you know, rising through after blowing the whistle, especially that's where it's uh, it's it's it's, you know, it's. You've never really seen that before. No, police officers yeah. are terrified to tell on other police officers yeah. or make statements against other police officers because it does ruin your career. And yeah. other cops, they don't want to work with you yeah. if you get out there and tell the truth. So how does one rise? How does one rise in the middle of that? Yeah, good question. Uh, I don't want to give it all away. No, no, no. I, but I, I just you. think these are things that people need so, to understand. So what I did is I studied whistleblowers before me. You know, as okay. far as Frank Serpico, who's like the godfather of police whistleblowing, to, um, you know, one of my heroes, Adil Polanco, um, who was part of, part of my, you know, I essentially jumped on the, the lawsuit um, and, and, you know, became the lead plaintiff. One of the things that they didn't have was the community support. Because the thinking is, once you expose this information, people are going to take it and they're going to they're gonna do what they need to do with it, apply pressure where it's necessary. But especially after, you know, as we see what social media has done to attention span, you got to hold people's hands a little bit. So what I decided was the community support that I hope would happen, I met with them before I blew the whistle. Mm -hmm. I explained to them who I am, what I've been doing, what I'm trying to accomplish. And some of them were like, yeah, nah, <laughs> we're good. Others were like, we'll see. And others was, were on board to, um, immediately. And um, that's, so when I become a whistleblower officially through a New York Times article, um, as much as the police department, as much as the leadership wanted to excommunicate me and, and destroy my career, too many people were watching, you know? The people that were normally protesting police were standing shoulder to shoulder with me in press conferences. There's nothing in the playbook to deal with that. Your dad recommended um, you join this profession. Um, and even when you were younger, you were like, really? Yeah. What was, what was, what, what was that like? Yeah, I, I, it was after school. It was so random. I, I to, you know, unfortunately he's no longer here. I don't know where that came from. Maybe he just thought, you know, it's a good job. It has good benefits. Um, but I thought he was crazy at the time, <laughs> you know, uh, you know, just a few years later, I'm in the police academy. It's crazy. And so how do you, how do you feel about your journey 
now when you get a chance to pull back a little bit and, and look at like your 15 years you spent yeah. in the work you're doing now? Like what, what's some of the things you just think about when you just reflect on that whole experience? One, wow, I can't believe we're here. Um, I can't believe I've, I've survived what I've survived with the retaliation and everything else from speaking out. Even before being a whistleblower, I spoke out internally, you know, and it was like a nuisance to the leadership in, in, my, in the command that I worked in. Um, I'm glad that there were some results. Again, not deeply planted enough, but there were some results. Um, I do miss being there for my community. Mm. especially as a lieutenant. That's know. what I wanted to know, yeah. like the main thing about, yeah. you know, when you talk about like the conversation around what needs to be fixed and changed is so heavy, but then there has to be some other things about the profession you missed. Like yeah. if I was a cop, I would never be at a red light. I would be walking, <laughs> oh, those in, a, I'd be walking in a bodega. I'd give me two egg sandwiches. And, you know. Yeah, that's, that's kind of corruption. <laughs> but yeah, no, being there for is the it free? Is, is it some, it's a lot of stores cops eat free, can, right? No. I know it's like that. It's like that in the state of Maryland. Like they literally get So that was, that was kind of like, it used to be that way. <laughs> but that was kind of, um, that's kind of frowned upon today. Right. But but that was there was a time if a restaurant dared charge a cop, it's like you just you just ruined your whole business because they'll yeah. sit and ticket everyone that pulls up. They'll make sure you feel it, you know. But those days are thankfully mostly behind us. But being there for the community, you know, responding to an emergency as the lieutenant on the scene, the person calling the shots, it meant a lot to to certain communities, especially marginalized communities who don't see policing as a public good, a tax funded service. They see police as people who harass them and, you know, violate their rights. But when Lieutenant Raymond shows up, for many folks, it's the first time they feel the true service aspect of, of policing. And that hurt, that actually hurt me because it's like, it shouldn't be this way. Because I remember being a rookie, being temporarily assigned to South Brooklyn in the, you know, in the white community. And as I'm standing on the corner, kids, adults passing by, thank you for your service. And I was like, well, People, that's the thing to say to cops. Like I, you know, that's that's not how, how it was in the hood where I was from, but it makes sense for them to say that because they get the true service. Um, so you get the full benefits. Exactly what it's supposed to be, right? So being able to be in charge and get, delivering that to a demographic that unfortunately doesn't really feel that 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 was that was something that that that's something I definitely miss. Chris Rock has a cop joke where um, he's talking about police officers and he's talking about a few bad apples and he says some jobs can't have bad apples and he said what if you went to the United or Delta and they said well most of our pilots land planes but we have a few bad apples right <laughs> right and I think you do such a good job in the book at talking about that bad apple conversation and where it's flawed C could you touch on that yeah so a lot of the response to the issues we see with policing, it's centered on the individual, the, the so-called bad apple. What I found, and I saw it that way somewhat, but- You had to grow into- Exactly. Yeah, okay. well, I have, I, have, you know, I have a look under the hood, a real right. look behind the curtain. So what I found is so much of the behavior coming from cops that can lead to, to someone dying needlessly, it's- the behavior is not their own autonomy. They're essentially responding to the incentives of the system. And that's where the focus needs to be. And it's much more, you know, like, it's closer to the root of the problem. You know, it's, we can't go too far downstream. We have to get as close as possible. And focusing on the system and challenging, asking ourselves, why did that cop make those decisions to do that? instead of thinking we have the answer because it's who they are. Mm -hmm. What I've learned is the system, because I watch people who I was in the police academy with for six months who I know are not terrible people, but when I would back them up out on patrol, I, I don't recognize them. So when I would pull them over later and say, yo, what was that earlier? I was like, oh, I'm on vacation this month. I got vacation this month, so I got to just quickly get my activity out the way. You know, this, this is when I really start to understand how the demands of the leadership, what's incentivized, those numbers, arrest summonses and stop and frisk, is much more a determining factor um, to why police behave the way they do than what their own biases are. 
And this is why that, that conversation is so important because if we really pull it back, there's assholes in every profession. Every. There's a terrible lawyer, there's a terrible doctor, I'm a writer, most of the writers I know I can't stand them. Like, <laughs> there's bad people in every profession and I think people get frustrated when they have to put conversation with police officers because there's so many cops and obviously you're different, you wrote a whole book about it, but there's so many cops who won't say, yo, I got a partner or a coworker who's tripping, who's out of control, I don't know what's wrong with them. So. I think that's part of the problem, but then when you go back and look at the numbers like stop and frisk and, and things like that, and mm -hmm. when you're talking about like um, how people, how black and brown people are more affected when it comes to drug laws and all of these different things, mm -hmm. then we're having a real conversation about the system and we're taking it away from individual people. Exactly. Um, and you know, don't get me wrong, there's a few individuals that where it matters, uh, the leadership. Um, you know, when I, one thing I wasn't prepared for when I first became a whistleblower was all of the support from officers, especially those high up in the ranks. And when they would, when we would have these conversations, it was like, yeah, man, the job, you know how the job is? The jo and I'm like, you a chief, you are the job. You know what I mean? But they uh, were scared to do what you did. Exactly, like, but they didn't, it's like they didn't understand their own power. I always think about the movie um, Coming to America where King, uh, you know, the... Um, Jaffe Joe? Jaffe, yeah, where, you know, they're going back, you know, he had come to New York, he realized that his son, did not agree with an arranged marriage. And as they're getting home, you know, going back to Africa. My son works. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> as they're going back to that was the, that was the, the iconic line. <laughs> but as they're going back to Africa, he's basically saying, these have been our traditions. Who am I to do anything about it? Mm -hmm. And the, his wife goes, you're the king. You're the king. You know, like understand the power that you're in when you're a chief. Understand that the power that you have when you're a chief. Um, but the fact that you're a chief and you're saying, yeah, this job, this job. I'm like, they don't understand their own power. So believe it or not, it's a handful of individuals that actually keep the wheels turning. But they have been indoctrinated to believe that this is what policing is. This is how policing is, needs to operate, especially because, let's be honest, in certain communities, we do have you know, serious issues with crime. But the response is not what it should be. And sadly, the diversity thing isn't the answer either because... The system has a way of making sure the people of color who ascend are those who are not going to upset the apple cart, you know? How did you feel when you found out um, that it was going to be like your last day? Like, like what was, what was going through your work. mind when you yeah, decided it was, to leave? Yeah, it was bittersweet. On one end, I'm ready to, you know, take on this new initiative. But it, it did hit me like, wow, this is it. This new uniform will never come on again. 15 years, I, I, I became a man in this position. I was 22 when I joined the police department. You know, 15 years, like this is, this is, this is unbelievable, but, but I'm ready for this, 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 you know, this other part of the journey. What was your mindset like? Um, I mean, you weren't on the street, you were a lieutenant, well, I guess yeah. you was on the street. No, so I was, I, I, yeah, I, I was, yeah, I was on it. It was just like, wow, it's, it's all about to happen. You know, it's about to happen. There's risk involved, because, you know, I retired five years earlier than I was supposed to. Um, but that's the rule in New York. You do 20, 20 yeah. So, right. So you don't get a pension. If you retire early, you have to wait to what would have been your 20th year. You know, your health benefit, I have no health benefit. And then you get partial. You yeah. Get you get a, you don't get 50, you get like 43% instead of 50 of what your final salary was. So, you know, I'm not leaving, um, I'm not losing everything. But, but you're losing a lot. Oh, I, oh, it's a lot. A whole lot. Oh, it's a lot. I don't even, <laughs> I think about it every now and then, but. You know, I'm 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 gonna be okay. I have to be okay. Uh, I'm a man on a mission since I was, a, you know, teenager. Really, you think about it, and um, I'm I'm getting it done. There's a lot of young uh, people of color entering the profession right now, and they they feel the same way you felt. They're young. They don't maybe necessarily understand the dynamics of everything that you you know that you've learned throughout your years um, wearing a badge. What do you think they should know coming in, or what kind of message do you have for them right now? You have to stand firm in who you are and, and don't compromise your integrity. If it doesn't make sense, that's, that's your intuition talking. Um, I mean, do it in a way that you're not going to, you know, it's within legal parameters, of course, but don't, don't lose yourself in this. Don't get sucked into the system 
forgetting who you are and, and where your own personal values are. Because again, I watch colleagues who I knew from the academy were not terrible people. And um, today, most of them are supporters. Some of them, you know, they won't say anything to me. Today, most of them are supporters. And when we have conversations about the way that they use the police, they're like, listen, man, I signed up for a job. I wasn't like, I wasn't thinking like you. I was just trying to pay my bills. This right. is what they want, wanted of me. It's like, I didn't think I was violating anyone because it's not like I was making it up. They were committing the infractions. I wasn't paying attention to the fact that, you know, in Park Slope, three miles away, the same infraction wouldn't be enforced. I would, Absolutely yeah, not. I wasn't paying, it was like, yeah, it's just littering. Yeah, it's just, you know, not paying the subway. But I'm not sitting here thinking about the fact that other folks don't get treated like this. I'm just knowing you did it technically. So I'm a cop. I have every legal right to stop you and arrest you. You know, I wasn't basically connecting all the dots. And one of the analogies I use in the book is an assembly line, right? If we're building the Model T Ford, you put it on the windshield, I put in, you know, the transmission, despite our individual repetitive task, we know what the final product is, the, the vehicle. Mm -hmm. In policing, people have repetitive tasks, but they don't see the bigger picture of what they're contributing to. You know, they just keep doing their repetitive task. When you zoom out and see the, the picture for what it is, you realize the, the mission statement of what policing is supposed to be theoretically is not what black and brown communities are getting. What's the perfect system um, look like for you? You know what's crazy? Some people might say per perfection is impossible. I would agree with that. But the fact that there are people who already receive the, the system that I think we, is needed is more than enough proof that we can do it. Marcus Garvey said, whatsoever man, can, man has done, man can do again. The fact that white communities get that type of policing, there's no reason why that's the perfect community. system you know I mean? for me. Like I'm yeah. on, Which I is, it's literally what the white people already get. As crazy as that sounds. Yeah, I'm <laughs> I'm I'm a writer and a teacher. I don't call the police for anything unless I need an insurance report. Yeah. Like I literally don't expect a police officer to like, yeah. you know, somebody break in my house. I get an insurance claim, but like if you rob me on the street, even I'm at a loss. Or you know, if it's something yeah. really important, I might. I probably won't even try to get something yeah. important back at this big age. But. I, I think a perfect system is for me to be like, hello? Yeah, send over uh, Officer Joe McGillicuddy yeah. and the gang. You know, yeah. I, I, I have a problem. So <laughs> procedural, procedural, justice, procedural justice, right. believe in the system. I, I remember- um, What my tax dollars worth? That's yeah, right. right, exactly. Before, before I got promoted to sergeant, I was working at the Barclays. And, you know, it was my job to scan the station. I'm watching movement. I'm, you know, chit-chatting with my colleagues. But I noticed this young um, Asian, uh, young boy, and he's standing by the turnstiles and you know I'm, I'm, he's on the pay side so he could go and take the train but after about 45 minutes i walk over to him i says everything all right and he says I i'm lost i said i made eye contact with you at least 30 times like you didn't think you can come to me and that hurt man he didn't think that he when he saw my me and my, my colleagues he didn't think help he didn't right. think safety he didn't think you know, someone to help him solve the issues. And that, that really bothered me, man. But on the, at the same end, in the very same station, in another day, a, 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 another lost kid, coincidentally, I never, never made the connection that we're both lost kids. He, we were helping him. But then there was, on the adjacent side of the platform, there was a crowd forming with cameras. So I'm like, you know, what's going on? You know, they're like, we just want to make sure he's safe. And I'm like, <laughs> the kid is lost, man. <laughs> like, I'm, <laughs> you know, and I get it. Right, right? That's right. how untrusting people are of the system. So the kid that should have come up and said, we need your help, he didn't see me there and saw me as help. That, that burns. But then the kid that we were helping, you know, bystanders were like, what does this cop do with this kid? Imagine that, 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 that limbo, you know? What, what's next for you, politics? Man, listen, I tried, I ran for office based on what, the people were asking of me. Also, a lot of what I'm putting forward, we need brave elected officials to actually make happen in legislation. So I figured I didn't wait to be the good cop, the cop that people need needed. Why should I wait to try to find the elected officials? I'll be that elected official. The, the you know the election didn't go in my favor, um, but now I'm thinking, would it have limited me in in the larger picture of what I believe I can accomplish, um, you know, it might have been, it, it might have limited my, my potential. So what's next exactly? 
I, I don't know, but I know what I do know is I want to empower others because over 2,000 cops have reached out from mm. all over the country, some even from other nations, and the type of guidance that they need, I'm like, somebody has to be there to guide this fight. So just stay tuned, and you know, you'll see yeah, me out there. I think, I think you're the guy to do it. Tell I everybody where that. they can pick up an inconvenient copy. Uh, you can find the book anywhere and everywhere books are sold. It's, it's amazing to be able to say that. <laughs> um, you know, uh, Barnes & Noble, Target, Walmart, uh, those who use uh, online, you can go to Penguin Random House, Amazon. Uh, it's, it's really a, uh, it's an honor to be able to say that the book is available everywhere books are sold. Thank you. Brother. <laughs>